Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Thilo Rehren, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here tonight um, for the public lecture by Professor Cyprian Broadbank um, to celebrate five years of activities of the A.G. Leventis Chair in Archaeological Sciences. More on that later. First, the pleasurable things. Um, and I would like to invite the president of the Cyprus Institute, Professor Stavros Malas, to say a few welcome words. Distinguished guests, welcome, Mr. Levandis, Mr. David, members of the board, former minister. It is really a great honor to celebrate this event five years after the um, Institute re received the Levendis Foundation support. Um, for us, it is welcome, Commissioner. For us, it's one of the greatest honors to receive A.G. Levendis Foundation support. There is no Cypriot that doesn't know the contribution of the Levendis Foundation in education, particular culture, cultural heritage, then there is no archaeologist that probably has not received support from the Levendis Foundation. The contribution is monumental. And if I were to compare it with um, uh, what's happening in other countries, I would definitely equate it to the contribution, at least in my field, of the Wellcome Trust in the United Kingdom. So the Levendis Foundation was supporting research and education before the state actually had any structures to support research and education in any field. And that really is credit to the founders and the people are representing it tonight. Now here at the Institute we take pride, uh, not only for the support, but on the fact that we're a an ecosystem of converging specialties. Natural sciences, humanities converge in this center to address questions of the past, primarily tangible cultural heritage. And of course, we're also concerned about intangible cultural heritage, and we'll have some ideas on that to propose to the government. It is also important for you to know that this institute is completing 16 years of existence, of operation. It is, I'm coming now from an event in, in, in Limassol and I, I, where there was a lot of startups and innovation, and I take pride in the fact that I've been given the opportunity to lead this organization because the work done so far under the leadership of Costas Papanegolas, who happened not to be here tonight because he's in the United States, it's been really outstanding. The work done by all colleagues has been outstanding. And now the Institute is able to take pride on the fact that it's one of the most successful, if not the most successful, institute in the country. So with these comments, I'd like to welcome the guest who is, uh, I don't know if your name actually identifies somehow with Cyprus, but obviously you're working a lot on that. And thank you, a very distinguished guest, Tilo will say a lot on this. So, and tomorrow we have, obviously, the more official events where a lot more will be said about the contribution of this support to the Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Malas. Allow me to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Cyprian Broadbank, Grew up in Britain, studied in Oxford history, I believe, moved on to Bristol for Aegean prehistory, did a PhD in Cambridge on, in the Faculty of Culture. So he clearly is very well prepared. And then he went to the UCL Institute of Archaeology in the mid 1990s, where he spent 20, I hope, happy years. Um, we overlapped there for a, a good dozen years. What I remember from Cyprian from that is 
on the one hand, his clear academic scholarship outstanding. He was promoted from lecturer to professor very quickly for Mediterranean archaeology. But the main impact he had in that institute, which has at any one time around 200, 250 doctoral students, to really shake up our graduate mentoring system and accelerate the time that our PhD students took to graduate, bring it down considerably, which is in everybody's interest. The student mustn't stick around for too long. They want to move on. We want them to move on so that we can have new ones. He really did a great job there mentoring the next generation. It didn't went unnoticed. He then, around 2014, I believe, got the call to the chair in Cambridge. Now, when I first heard about that, it's a Disney chair at the McDonald Institute. <laughs> but I assure you, it's no laughing matter. It is probably the most prestigious chair in the UK in archaeology, and therefore, by default, more or less in Europe. And Cyprian has been filling this role fantastically ever since. He has again shook up the system there, brought it onto a new good trajectory, and focus at the same time still, well, when I say focus on the Mediterranean, uh, that's a contradiction, obviously. Um, but he managed to write a good book on the making of the Middle Sea, the Mediterranean, which was published in 2013 got a couple of fantastic prizes, a Wolfson History Book Prize and so on. So I think it's 10 years since then. It's about time, Cyprian, that you update it. So let's see what you have to say about the remaking of the Middle Sea with archaeological science. Cyprian, thank you personally so much for being here and offering us that lecture. Please come. hope we might be able, there we are, thank you. Thank you for those very, very warm and kind words. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here, to see so many colleagues and friends and uh, future academics gathered here together. Um, and it's a great honor to be part of the celebrations of the first five years, first five glorious years, of the A.G. Leventis Chair in Archaeological Sciences at the Cyprus Institute. And equally, work by the team that he's built up so effectively and wisely, all of whom are in this room, and all of whom I'm afraid will appear on the screen at one point or other, largely through their own kind gift of PowerPoint slides last night that illustrate them in action in various exciting um, uh, moments. Um, as will be evident to most, if not all of you, I am not an archaeological scientist, and that's my opening disclaimer. In fact, my sciencey friends tend to keep me as far from machines and databases and computers as they possibly can, particularly after an unfortunate event in which I backed my way out of a rather fancy lab and hit my elbow on a red button, the consequences of which were temporary, thankfully, but embarrassing at the time. What I am is a long-term end-user collaborator uh, with archaeological scientists and a huge admirer of the potential. And my aim today is to explore the overlap, if you like, in the Venn diagram between what I suggest we should want to know as Mediterranean archaeologists and what archaeological science can or might one day soon be able to deliver. It's an exciting time in that sense and it's also a propitious moment personally and slightly selfishly in that uh, Tilo was kind enough to um, mention a book I wrote nearly 10 years ago and the publishers are chasing me for a second edition. All they're going to allow me is a new preface in which I can spend 20 pages trying not to unpick several thousand, hundreds of thousands of words that I wrote 10 years ago, but trying to say what has changed. And in fact, I'm very grateful um, for this opportunity to force me to think about what is different now. And many of those changes are, of course, in the realm of what might broadly be discussed as archaeological science. Now, that overlap on the Venn diagram is an exciting place to be, and it's a growing space. 
And I think that's one important takeaway message. Because thanks both to new techniques and to much more integrated training and practice and understanding and dialogue from both ends of the spectrum, we've already got a long way towards eroding any of that kind of ghost of the two cultures um, paradigm. The opposition of arts and humanities and social sciences and sciences. We're all together to a much greater degree. And I think that's showing, particularly in the kind of training that people get here um, and in pretty well every institute that Tilo's touched um, in terms of creating a better and more integrated way of thinking. I'll come back to that. Now, why does this matter? It matters to my mind because as archeologists, we need to combine insights if we're gonna have any hope of rich understandings. In David Clark's famous phrase, there's an enduring misapprehension about the archeological record, that it is somehow a solid thing with a few unfortunate holes in it, rather like a Swiss cheese. David Clark, nearly half a century ago, went on, rough, almost exactly half a century ago, in fact, went on to say, this is a radical misapprehension. What the archeological record or the fragments of the past that remain are like, and it's a nice scientific simile, is the thinnest of precipitates of surviving information, suspended like motes of dust in an ocean of loss. I still get goose pimples thinking of archaeology that way. It makes me think how mad we are to try to do it, how heroic we are to achieve what we achieve, and how important it is that we do it, because if we don't, there is nothing. There is a truncated history of our species of a few centuries, a few thousand years, limited and biased in every way in time and space. So archaeology out there is an extraordinary discipline. And that comes to my next point, in a way. It does involve profound challenges, and I think it calls for radically innovative ways of thinking. It's a real challenge, and I couldn't put it better, really, than, yes. So, the first thing I want to say is, yes, before I get to that, we have, um, that's in the wrong order. Yes, mongrels. We are not purebreds on the left. We have Nellie Broodbank. She's a 17th century breed. She's very pretty. She's extremely cute, and she's pretty not so bright. And in fact, as you can see, she's dropped the ball already. What we need to be, as archaeologists, is what you see on the other side. We need to be mongrels, we need to be savvy, we need to be clever about combining data, we need to be pack hunters. We need to work together, and we need, in a way, to get away from the idea that archaeology is, in some sense, a pure discipline. It's a meeting of fields. And that's what's so exciting about it. And I think, incidentally, that's why it's an incredibly good training for global citizens of the future, because the problems we face in this world are not disciplinarily specific. They're complicated, fiddly decisions that involve lots of thinking about and bringing together lots of different problematics. And that, and I say this after 30 years of teaching archaeology, that is exactly what we teach when we do archaeology. You have to be able to understand roughly where a genetic argument is coming from. You need to be able to understand social theory. You need to be able to understand quantitatively and qualitatively. And if you think about it, there are not many degree disciplines that actually involve that. So I'm very proud of archaeology, and I think it's an area where, in a sense, the less we worry about definitional boundaries, the better we do, and the more creative the archaeology we create. So the slide that I thought was coming up now is this one. Couldn't put it better than Matt Damon, as Mark Watney, US astronaut, stranded on Mars. I hope all of you have seen that wonderful movie, The Martian, and his famous line, so in the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm gonna have to science the hell out of this. In fact, those of you who know the movie will know that the fourth from last word there is not actually what he says, but this is a very family-friendly lecture, uh, so we'll leave it um, at that. What does this mean? As I've said, we need to be savvy, we need to be data omnivores, we need to be curious, flexible, clever, pack animals. We also, I think, need to develop, all of us, a certain scientific literacy, an ability at least to discern a good and a bad argument from scientific data, to know, in a sense, how the limits and the potentialities of inference work, 
just as much as scientists need to understand the social. And I'm not talking about rocket science here. As C.P. Snow famously put it, to ask someone for a definition of some of the basic concepts in science really is the equivalent of asking a humanities student if they know how to read. <laughs> OK? So we really do need to get good at understanding where our science colleagues are coming from and what makes a good argument and challenging that. Now, you'll probably be by this stage beginning to wonder if you came to the wrong lecture as it appears to be bizarrely devoted to cheese and dogs and astronauts. Um, but I think it's probably worth at this stage um, giving a brief summary for those of you who may be less familiar about what I include in archaeological science. Well, the answer is a lot. It's a very broad spectrum, a range of things. Much of it is mainstream, some of it is brand new, some of it's cutting edge, some of it's under development. And those of you who are going to be here for the next two days will hear a lot about those current approaches and their affordances and limitations of what they can tell us about the past. Um, in much more detail from people who really do know what they're talking about. But in brief, this is the kind of thing we're looking at. We're looking at material science, understanding the technology of ancient materials, um, and it's not coincidental that in the background of those two images, the periodic table and a geological map, um, in a sense grounding our understanding of production and circulation and consumption of things in the chemistry and the geology and the petrography and such like of these. Environmental science, Evie, you sent me this, so thank you. <laughs> Evie, not looking particularly fascinated by a heavy residue there, um, and uh, a colleague doing the, uh, the initial working, but of course not simply archaeobotany, archaeozoology, zooarchaeology as it's better referred to, palynology, the study of pollen, um, geoarchaeology and such like. Thirdly, osteoarchaeology. Here we have Effie, your turn, tormenting a bone. I'm not quite sure what you're doing to it, uh, but it's not resisting you at any rate. Um, human skeletal analysis, health, diet, life history, and such like. Chronometric science. Dirt, if I'd known you were here, I wouldn't have put such a cheesy and basic diagram up, but you get the idea, the various scientific ways of measuring different time depths. Most famously, of course, radiocarbon, but many other techniques, particularly for deeper time understanding. Computational and digital science, including, of late, machine learning. Um, here, one could have put up umpteen slides. What I put up here is a rather interesting one that Andy Bevan did recently, which shows over time, from its origin to its middle Byzantine demise, uh, the size and volume of, um, the range and size and volume of Mediterranean amphorae, one of the classic shapes that moves stuff around the Mediterranean and how, in a sense, it starts with quite specific missions, expands and contracts. So the ways in which we can model amphora dimensions and then actually understand the dynamics of one of the fundamental shapes of the Mediterranean over a couple of thousand years. Remote sensing, which is a very broad umbrella term for a variety of things from geophysical to underwater to satellite to most recently drone-based approaches. Here, some of the work we're doing in Morocco with Toby Wilkinson and Moad Radi, um, on a site in Morocco, getting the thing up, and off it goes into the dawn. Biomolecular science, illustrated here by one of the cutting-edge applications um, to understanding the contents of early pottery at Chatelhuyuk West, around 6000 BC. This, of course, is what Christian Christiansen has referred to as the third scientific, scientific revolution in archaeology, one of genes and proteins and isotopes and other residues pushing back so many things we never thought we could get at. Pushing back the earliest evidence of plague, detecting new hominin species from tiny hand digits, tracking population movements, drilling down on kin groups, identifying the skins in a medieval manuscript, the lapis lazuli, the nun's teeth, the seven species milt in ancient Mongolia. Extraordinary things have been produced by this over the last 10, 12 years. So, three key points that I think we need to flag about a fast-changing and currently, I hope self-evidently, thrilling field. This is a really good time for archaeological science and for archaeology in general. But three points. Firstly, in rushing to the new, our natural excitement and attraction to the new, we must not forget the huge informational virtues of what one might call the standard. The animal bones, the seeds, the soils, the fabric analysis of pots, metals, and such like, for a variety of reasons. 
These are going to remain the backbone of our understanding. These are going to produce the big samples and a huge amount of the big understanding of human behavior for the foreseeable future. And indeed, and I'm very grateful to my colleague Marcos Martino Torres for supplying this wonderful chart, which I didn't know about until he mentioned it to me, but it exemplifies something that I've thought about in archaeological science for 30 years. It's called the Gartner Hype Cycle. And take a minute to look at it, because it's very profound and also very funny. <laughs> this is the route that almost all innovations in archaeological science take. Innovation trigger, peak of inflated expectations. Well, I might put that rather more rudely, but you know what I mean. It's the first six months to three years of the nature papers and everything else. Followed inevitably by trough of disillusionment, as people say, well, actually, the method doesn't work, and it's not saying, well, it says it does, and everything else. The slope, long, painful, of enlightenment. And finally, what we really want to get to, the plateau of productivity. Tilo rather tersely said to me earlier today, that's fine, but he reckons that the level off is usually rather more like this than somewhere up there. Uh, but anyway, it levels off and we get the good data. And the point I want to make is, firstly, it's actually really interesting to think of any archaeological science you know about or involved in and think, how does its history fit on that map? Where is it now? What might we expect? How might we try to avoid some of the crazy oscillations by being a little bit more careful about what we say, for example, um, particularly in the early days? Um, but also, the point is that many of the cutting edge ones that are hitting the headlines at the moment are right over on the left of that graph. But some of the stuff that's producing the best information, of course, is over on the right. Um, and these move over time, of course, so we have to kind of nurture these things through. Secondly, and it's an obvious point, in terms of sample size, we have to balance up the extraordinary insights from tiny new innovations, tiny numbers of new innovations, of innovations, and large amounts of standard data. So if you ask me, would I prefer one new whole genome sequence or 500 comparable and excellent zoo archaeological reports. Well, I'd say 500 of each, please, actually, is what I'd say. But if I really had to choose, it'd be a close call, to be honest, because we're nowhere near 500 archaeological, zoo archaeological reports that are comparable. If we were, the goal in that would be extraordinary. Um, another point to make, uh, which is, I think, essential to the present situation, is that equipment is getting ever more portable. It's basically shrinking from something the size of a US fridge down to something like a hairdryer. And um, that's vital. It means things are more portable, more accessible, generally cheaper, faster, less destructive, and you can run hugely more samples. And this is a quiet revolution. This is just a revolution in your, the kit you carry around, but it's also enormously democratizing and enormously powerful because it's meaning that stuff can be done on the ground by local people, it, bigger samples can be done, and it doesn't have to be taken back to some remote lab and some huge machine somewhere else in the world where one day the people who actually submitted that sample might get the result, okay? It's actually on the spot stuff, and this is a radical transformation. And I think the third thing I'd like to point out, which is again relevant to this pivotal moment we find ourselves in, is the consequence of this growth is that the size of critical mass archaeological science units has expanded. I think if you go back to the kind of world that I just saw as a graduate student in the 80s, you might say that an archaeological an outfit, any archaeological outfit that had, say, four archaeological scientists was doing pretty well. I think you see, you know, say probably you need, well, you can all take your guess, eight now maybe, in terms of core technique, seven, eight. And that's not being picky. And that means more investment, but it also means more collaboration because we cannot all be that big. Um, as an ex-head of a department in Cambridge, I scratch my head saying, we have only so many holes to fit the pegs into, and here are all these pegs. How on earth do we manage everything we want to do with that many holes. <laughs> um, we have to collaborate, not only because it's good for us, but because it actually has become essential given the, the diversification of the field. So that's a few general thoughts. Why is the Mediterranean so good 
for archaeological science. Well, there are four basic reasons, and I'm going to add a fifth as to why it's not so good. One thing is, quite simply, we know an enormous amount, thanks to at least to 150 years of archaeology. The quantity and the granularity of our data is astonishing. So on the left, Sophia Schliemann, wearing a rather famous set of kit from the 1870s, or rather, <laughs> the early Bronze Age, um, <laughs> but via the 1870s. On the right, um, a slide of the Uluburun shipwreck, which will be familiar to all of you, and depending on whether you count each bead separately, there are tens, if not hundreds of thousands of objects on this, what, 30 by 20 meters of seabed. Yeah, extraordinary, unprecedented, but not so unusual in terms of the Mediterranean. I've forgotten the exact quantity. Someone told me, Sturt, you may remember. West House Akrotiri. Pottery assemblage of 270 pots, roughly? 300. Hey, <laughs> they've mended a few since I last read about it. Um, see what I mean? That's just one household. Secondly, the geology is really helpful. And this is a product of kind of tortured tectonics, uh, the meeting of plates, the upthrust of strange bits of old rock. Um, creating these kind of peacock patterns, which are not typical of the whole world, and allow us to do enormous amounts of geological fingerprinting, saying where is and is not compatible, or what is and is not compatible, with being an origin point for this very specific kind of thing we're seeing in the pottery, or the metal, or the glass, or whatever it might be. So in this case, on the right, um, and this is um, still a nice graphic description. So there are the four sources of obsidian in the central Mediterranean. We can distinguish them, and we can say where each one actually ends up, which is pretty triumphant. Um, I don't think for a minute those are actually the straight line routes that any boat or person took, um, but that would be the next question. So how actually do you warp that, to use a word we'll come back to, to fit the actual navigational realities of the Mediterranean? Um, thirdly, and this is one of these glaringly obvious points we tend to forget about, its material culture is highly mineral-based, a lot of it, not all of it, and therefore durable. In other words, we find it. And you might say, well, so what? But down below, on the bottom, I've put three of the main precious commodities that circulated in what, for me, is actually the closest long-term parallel to the Mediterranean world, and that's island Southeast Asia, which is very, very similar in its relation to China um, and independently in the, to, the, to the Mediterranean. And there, the three things that people would kill and die for are bird of paradise feathers, beche de mer, sea cucumbers, bullion ostimor, <laughs> and of course spices. None of which normally survive archaeologically. And fourthly, the extraordinary diversity of exceptional survival context. Can you think of any other area of the world that has volcanoes, glaciers, dry caves, and wetlands all crammed in to one maritime basin. And that gives us chances to catch things that normally would never survive. And those are the things, to my mind, that we need to ring very, very hard, because they are giving you an unadulterated, undepleted picture of what the past was like. And we'll come back to that too. The caveat, the bad news, is that at a very general level, the warmer the environment, the less good the ancient DNA preservation. And this is one reason why ADNA has taken longer and less successfully to extract from the Mediterranean than further north. So that's one area in which the same things that are so positive in some ways are not working well today. So my focus today is on a selection of questions that's somewhere between eight and nine. Um, every time I count it, it comes out a bit differently. Um, from a much longer list, um, most of them are focused on prehistory, and that's just a personal bias to my own research interests. Um, but many of the observations I'll be making, as many of you will realize, are at least as applicable in other often later times. And you just need to look at the kind of work that Mike McCormick and others are leading in Harvard, for example, to see the kind of transformations going on in the broader classical Roman and later medieval world of the Mediterranean too. Except for the first and the last, where we begin and we end in Africa, there's no particular order to these. So you can take them, they're not a pecking order, they're just a series of thoughts. There are things I would like to know about, and maybe archaeological science is about to tell us something. First one. So who was there before us? When? And what kind of things were they up to? Well, for a long time, 
it seemed pretty straightforward. The Mediterranean was what I called in 2013 a speciating sea, a divider between, very simply, evolving us in Africa to the south and evolving others, diverging, dead ends and such like, Neanderthals and others, to the north. And that led in itself to some quite interesting observations. For example, um, it's becoming increasingly apparent that Mediterranean Neanderthals, and by the way, if anyone disses Neanderthals, forget it, they're super clever, they're just a bit different, right? Um, Mediterranean Neanderthals do not behave like northern Neanderthals. They probably lived in the Mediterranean longer and did different kind of stuff. And one of the things that really interests me, I can't really go into the details of this, this is a map I did a long time ago, trying to map inviting kind of coastline and islandscape with um, evidence for early pre-Holocene seafaring in Cyprus, the Aegean, which is quite up there, the Straits of Sicily, and um, the, the Straits route to Corsica and Sardinia. Um, but one of the things that's really interested me is the increasingly compelling evidence that middle Paleolithic tools do exist on certain islands in the Mediterranean. And this is one of only two areas in the world where we can say possibly pre-modern humans crossed to islands and therefore did some, some kind of seagoing. And ba-boom, the other one is island Southeast Asia, where we have even more striking evidence, actually. So, what I began to be interested in is whether, in a sense, Mediterranean, Mediterranean conditions stimulate a kind of cognitive stretch in what Neanderthals do. And this ties up with a very current thought in human evolution, which is the concept of behavioral plasticity. Sounds grand, but basically means how flexible we are in the kind of ways we behave, how much we can learn and change fundamentals. Seems to me, or it did seem to me until relatively recently, that there was a very good chance that actually the Mediterranean was doing things to Neanderthals in interesting kinds of ways. Now, of course, what's thrown a bit of a spanner in the works is some archaeological science from the Apadama Cave in Amani, which I'm sure you've, many of you have read the headlines here. So, this is work by Katarina Havati um, and colleagues, and in essence, going back to a couple of skulls, this is actually not both of them, I think, but um, to a couple of skulls found at the Apadama Cave uh, quite a long time ago, and using modern techniques of digital scanning to try to reconstruct the skull, and then to date it. Um, what we have is clear evidence, well, not clear evidence, but fairly convincing evidence. Firstly, that this human, this is a Homo sapiens skull, and secondly, it's about 200,000 years old, which is about four times older than it ought to be. If that's true, we got out of Africa much, much earlier than anyone ever guessed. We don't know how far we got, how often. We don't know how we survived there. But it starts to make you think, if you're finding tools of this age on islands, who's making them? Who's dropping them? Suddenly, that's all up for grabs. Exciting. Second one. Question two, how can we learn more about later people's lives, our lives, us lives? So skeletons, of course, have a lot to tell, as both the work of Effie Nikita and Mahmoud Mardini, illustrated here, demonstrate life histories, childhood, childbirth, aging, occupation, diet, health, disease. These are skeletal remains from Hellenistic and Roman Phoenician sites, if I recall correctly, looking at what the life of a big city and a smaller settlement was like. What my Cambridge colleague John Robb has termed osteobiography. Nice term. Understanding your life through your bones, basically. Now, of course, this has been supplemented now by biomolecular approaches, isotopes, genetics in particular, recently exemplified by the first really big sample of genetic data, genome-wide data, from the prehistoric Aegean, 102 uh, sequenced by a team led and published by Philip Stockhammer et al. Many of you will have read, read this stuff. I'm going to give you a little kind of detail as to what they found, but let's think a little bit first about what we might learn from this kind of thing, because I think it's less self-evident than we might imagine. A lot of people would start by saying mobility, human mobility, moving around, okay? And in temperate Europe and in other areas of the world, the new archaeogenetics has certainly caught archaeology on the hop by proving there was a lot more movement, explaining a lot more of the change that we're seeing 
than archaeologists since the 1970s had really been happy to entertain. But, and I think there's a big but here, compared to temperate Europe, I think the Mediterranean has been in a very different position well before the, the genetic revolution hit us. In the Mediterranean, recognition of mobility as the norm has been hardwired into us since at least one seminal publication of the year 2000, The Corrupting Sea, which normalized the idea of everything between a small-scale Brownian motion and long-tail movement as what the Mediterranean is all about. And I think that's an important point in terms of where we got to as archaeologists in our understanding. We know from text, we know from archaeology, that things and people are moving around a lot for much of the past. So admixture, movement into, out of, and around the basin is kind of expected. And whatever you think about sea people, so bottom right, there's someone on the move. That's the Iceman. He's technically on the wrong side of the uh, watershed in the Alps to actually be Mediterranean. But the archaeological science of what he had eaten showed that he actually came from the southern Tyrol. So he was a Mediterranean man, very badly lost, um, and uh, uh, preserved for our benefit, sadly. Um, and top right, whatever you think of sea peoples, um, it's certainly about people moving about. Um, you can interpret it the Egyptian way. You can interpret it in many other ways. Uh, but there is mobility, and even pharaohs moving around there, so um, everyone gets to, uh, to circulate. But much more interesting, what we really want answers to, I think, is not mobility, yes or no, but the details. When, why, how, how many, how far, how often. This is what we really need to know if we're going to understand what keep, kept the Mediterranean moving and together. Nicholas Purcell, in fact, one of the two authors of The Corrupting Sea, put this very well in his classic article right back in 1990, Mobility and the Polis. Think about this. He said, how many native Greek speakers ever traveled more than 20 kilometers from where they were born in the 7th century BC? Was it 2% of the group or 25% or 50%? Well, the answer is, well, the answer was, we don't know, we haven't an idea, we haven't the faintest idea. But you can see that whichever answer you plumb for completely changes your approach to understanding the dynamics of emergent Greece and the Mediterranean. What I'm suggesting is that's the kind of information we need from archaeological science to actually understand what mobility is all about in a Mediterranean context. And in a sense, the genetics is starting to give some interesting and often confirmatory insights. For example, one of the most persistent genetic outliers in the whole Mediterranean is Sardinia. And that ties in quite interestingly with the idea of a very distinctive island society, the Neuragic civilization and its predecessors, keeping very much with a big hinterland as well, even when people come around the coast, um, to a very, very sort of distinctive, not exactly isolated, but distinctive way of life. The work that Stockhammer et al. have done um, has started to shed light on the opposite of the place like Late Bronze Age Hanya, Kedonia, where we see people from Crete, from the mainland, and possibly from the central Mediterranean. Now, the point I want to make, it's wonderful to see that. It sounds churlish to say, well, that's what we expected, and it's wonderful to see it, but this is, in a sense, the genetic equivalent to the kind of information you see in the Ugaritic archives. Multiple languages, multiple scripts, people coming and going. This is what a Mediterranean emporium looked like in the late Bronze Age, and we've captured it genetically. Perhaps more surprising, and I think the lasting way in which this genetic revolution is going to go, is looking at the micro details. For example, relatedness and social practice. And this, for my mind, is extraordinary. This is essentially a genetically analyzed family tree from a series of buried infants at the little hamlet of Migdalia, in southern Greece in the late Bronze Age. This is relatedness of individuals over several generations. It's the first time we've been able to do it in this part of the world. It's becoming more common. There have been some lovely examples from the UK. And it's extraordinary. It shows who is related to whom. And it's revealing some quite striking things. For example, there is a very unusual degree of first cousin intermarriage, which is not something that you usually see, and 
The point that the, 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 the experts who did this um, study make, and I think they're absolutely right here, is we don't really want the prurient details on cousin-on-cousin -cousin marriage, but the interesting thing is why, and we can theorise why that might be. One of the reasons they come up with is the importance of holding land together, holding land, holding together, particularly with fruit trees, long-term investments, and trying to make sure they keep within the family. So endogamy starts to work. Whatever the truth of this, one has to have a lot more case studies. This is, you know, this is one cis burial, basically, more or less, you know, from one site. A um, bit more than that, but roughly that. Um, this is going to revol re revolutionise Mycelian or Cypriot Late Bronze Age funerary understandings. The pots, the tombs, the skeletons, right? How we can make them work, what we can make them do, what they can tell. Uh, so this, I think, really is extraordinary. Question three. What were ancient Mediterranean landscapes really like? Well, most of what we look like, what most of the landscapes we study are radically depleted. It stands to reason. And my first message is from the Cambridgeshire Fens. You may have spotted this is not the Mediterranean. Um, this is a, a well famous site just north of Cambridge called Must Farm, excavated by the Cambridge Archaeological Unit. And the point is, it's a wetland with extraordinary preservation. So on the one hand, we have five or six Late Bronze Age, 900 BC, 950 BC, huts preserved with extraordinary detail. You can even see the shaving from the tips of the piles fallen at the bottom of the pile. Okay, it's that tight. But what, I, what interests me is that we're not, not really in this kind of condition, in this kind of circumstance, looking simply at sites. We should be looking at total undepleted landscapes. And in earlier excavations around Mus Farm, that's exactly what the unit found. They found waterways full of little fish traps. They found boats drawn up on the shore. These are total landscapes, okay? That's one of 17 fish traps, probably for eels, stuck in a little rivulet, okay, 3,000 years ago. Now, that's the kind of thing we might be targeting. And, of course, one of the benefits of the Mediterranean is we do have volcanic landscapes. Um, so on the one hand, we excavate settlements, famously like Akrotiri, less well-known Nola uh, Crotti del Papa, underneath one of the Avenino eruptions of, uh, um, in, of Vesuvius in central Italy. But the point I want to make, particularly for the latter, is that they have gone out beyond the houses. They found the hoof marks of the cattle being driven to and fro. They found a compound with eight pregnant goats locked together. They found buckets on fences, right? This is total landscape. And of course, even more than in the Cambridgeshire Fen, this is closed off in a moment. So to my mind, and who am I to say, if I were on Santorini now, I would be sticking a transect out from the main, I wouldn't be digging another house, I'd be sticking a transect out into the countryside and see what a late Bronze Age countryside really looked like. I think it could be extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. However, most of the Mediterranean, thankfully, is not covered in volcanic ash. Uh, so what we do, is we do things like field survey. This is the kind of thing I've spent 30 years doing. It's uh, tremendously informative, it's tremendous fun, it's tremendously expensive, and um, it may have got a little bit stuck in its ways. Back in 1998, we did try to pioneer new approaches. I look at this picture and I get the cold sweats about the health and safety issues that somehow in the 1990s didn't seem quite so important as they do today. He survived, he did the PhD with Tilo, I think, and uh, he's very happy. <laughs> I look back on, I still, I can't look at that picture. It's just too awful, uh, what might have happened. Anyway, um, but this kind of inkling is coming of age. This is work done by Hector Arengo and colleagues at the Tarragona Institute uh, and exemplified uh, by work they've been um, doing in a sense uh, a proof of concept on at uh, the classical sites of Abdera, uh, Agsanthi in Northern Greece. And it's basically saying, if you use drones, with cameras mounted to achieve detailed photogrammetry, and if, you apply, and if you combine that with machine learning, couldn't the drone spot the sherds without having to send hundreds of students, Thanasi, you'll know all about this, <laughs> through, through the Machia and the Frigana and everything for days and days? Um, well, this is the beginning of a proof of concept, um, and you've got, you know, the, uh, um, well, you've got, you know, what, this is one side, this is what, this is basically what the surface survey saw, this is what the drone saw, 
and such like on two combinations. This is very much under development. There are problems like the drone at the moment needs to go super flat, so if there's a tree or a hill, it doesn't work. But we're at the cutting edge, right? And what I think, in a sense, we're, I mean, this is, this is the first climb in the Gartner hype cycle, right? But the sooner we can get onto the plateau of, of, of productivity, I think what's going to emerge from this is a really interesting study in how the best in human cognition and input and the best in mechanization can work together. So hundreds of students don't have to thrash through thorn bushes for years finding nothing, but we can find the stuff, ground truth it, collect it and study it in much more effective ways. This could be a revolution, I think, in the coming years in field survey. Question four. What did what I rather obscurely and nomically put navigational envelopes of possibility? Seafaring technology mean for maritime connectivity. I think it's axiomatic for all of us that maritime travel is fundamental to the formation and the sustaining and the changing of all Mediterranean societies, or most Mediterranean societies. But how do we actually get at its dynamics? Well, one approach is to actually navigate, to model navigation and what's possible with it. And this is rather fun. And here it's rather hard not to tell bad stories about myself, or stories against myself, my younger self. Because uh, I tried to do this before any of the technology that was there to do it. And lots of people are having merry times saying how much better you can do it, which is great, because that's how things advance. And thanks to Katie Jarrell, um, one of Sturt's students, former PhD student, who responded by return to a desperate email saying, hello, you've never heard of me, could you send me figure three from your article? Um, this is, uh, and she replied very nicely, uh, this is a nice example. So here we are in the Cyclades. Uh, this is island uh, here, of course, is Keros, which will be well known to many of you. Um, and the two concentric circles are things that I was drawing in the late 1990s to say, well, let's try to understand these islandscapes. How far could a canoe go there and back in a day, in a circle? Or if it's just on a one-way trip, how far could it go overnight and come back? To get some idea of the experience scale of cycladic space. I would still argue that was order of magnitude insightful. What Katie managed to do is use a combination of GIS technology and much more precise wind and current data to say, actually, what's the kind of envelope of the possible in June, in July, in August, right? And at one level, I'm not too badly wrong, but I've got some things clearly out. For example, EOS, for those of you who don't know what it is, EOS is way more accessible than I've realized. Amorgos, less so, to which I might petulantly say, but there's an awful lot of pottery from Amorgos on Keros. And I'm not so much that sure there's so much from me so what is going on? But there's an argument to make there, right? Um, similarly, how does sailing technologies, what you can and cannot do with a sail, with early sail, how does it influence how you really get around? Uh, I won't show you my own rather kind of lamentable early efforts to look at this question, but I'll go straight to the really interesting one that Crystal Safadi and Fraser Sturt have done on modeling sailing to and from Byblos in the Bronze Age. So they're putting in, so we know quite a lot about what kind of ships they have. This is a Biblos ship from the uh, Old Kingdom uh, in Egypt. And they put in various variables about wind and current and behavior. And what you start to see is this extraordinary, what they call warping of sea space in terms of time. Yeah? How long it really takes. And they can do autumn and winter, morning and afternoon, very different regimes of wind direction. And you get an extraordinarily detailed understanding of how one might actually manage moving around in the early Mediterranean, with some surprises, which is good. But of course, in a way, the mother load is actually finding the ships themselves. Now, all of you will be aware that the Mediterranean is one of the richest area for shipwrecks. There are only two problems. Most of the ones in shallow water are only two discoverable and are depleted by all kinds of other activities and people. Secondly, those that are a bit deeper, and we're realizing this on continental shelves around the world, have been trashed by deep trawling. Basically, the bottom of the sea is plowed to death. So when we celebrate, up comes the Mesolithic arrowhead from Doggerland, from a, hut, from a trawler coming back to Humber, right? What we really mean is the absolute destruction of the land surface of Doggerland and one or two bits that stuck in the net. 
We're seeing that particularly in the Messina Strait, not Messina Strait, the Straits between Sicily and Tunis, which are about at that level. So there's obviously a real challenge to get at the deep, deep stuff, partly because it's probably untouched. Secondly, because we want to know actually whether they cross deep sea, because one model of ancient seafaring is they keep to the coast, which I didn't believe for a minute. So two stages in this, a lovely example from a few years back. Uh, I think this is, this is about 750 BC. It's a Phoenician wreck of southern Israel, probably heading towards Egypt, um, picked up remotely by uh, deep water sensors and cameras, and you can see, in a sense, the lading of that ship. More spectacular, have any of you followed this stuff? This is extraordinary. This is John Adams et al.'s work in the Black Sea. Two kilometers down, the Black Sea is anoxic. There's no oxygen. If you drop something organic into it, it's still there. That boat is 2400 BC. That's a late classical boat, 25 meters long, intact. Okay, getting down there with divers is another question. It's two kilometers, it'll kill you. Um, but they're there. And these are extraordinary possibilities. You know, you're actually, you know, there it is. Um, we can almost, often, we can often also make inferences from extremely unlikely sources of evidence about seafaring. Take Cyprus, early Cyprus. Jean-Denis Vigne, one of the leading zooarchaeologists of Cyprus, makes the excellent point, I don't know if there are two zooarchaeologists in the audience will agree, that the dental morphology, I'll say this very clearly, the dental morphology of the house mice from pre-pottery Neolithic Cyprus are so standard over more than a millennium and show none of the evidence for drift and change that you'd expect in an isolated population that he reckons a couple of new mice must have arrived on Cyprus every year. Those mice are not deliberate imports, they're stowaways. So that's two canoes a year. Neat. Okay, if he's right. Is he right? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> All right. Good. Question five, very brief. How and when did climate change actually impact on social lives and decisions? Well, I'm not going to go into this in much detail because we all know that climate change is right at the centre of everyone's agenda and virtually no one seems to write an archaeological application without saying that somehow the work they're doing on the distant past will solve climate change. Um, we've all been there. Um, but what does interest me um, is not so much simply the long-term fluctuations in climate and environment, but how they translate into human decisions and action, and how they really impact on event history. Things changing, either microcosmic, decisions of families, or big decisions. Now, there's been some pretty striking and impressive work showing temporal coincidences around the Roman Empire in terms of climate events, changes in the social constitution or the politics of the Roman Empire. I'm less convinced in the sense that we're getting there for prehistory. So in essence, the problem is, how do you combine this kind of millennial changes you see here with the kind of stuff you see here? This is just rainfall annually from Spain. But things are highly unpredictable in the short term, and the Mediterranean farmers know that, and they buffer for it. So my question is, when are those buffering systems overwhelmed, and what happens when they are? And how would we actually combine those timescales? to actually understand what goes on, rather than saying, ooh, look, within these 50 years, we've got a climate glitch. Ooh, look, within these 200 years, something goes wrong with the old kingdom, um, right? How we can actually model real human responses. And also, how we can bring in catastrophes of another kind. And that's my excuse to, just to show this slide, which is work by Amy Bogart and Charlotte Diffie, and it's quite extraordinary, and I just want to draw your attention to it. Evie, you all know this. Late Bronze Age Hattrasas, capital of the Hittite Old Kingdom at this stage, one of the great empires of antiquity. Somewhere in the, I think, 16th or late, or early 15th century BC, I should remember, this massive granary, incidentally built right along the edge of the fortification wall, inside it, this massive granary burnt. By most estimates, it contained between 5,500 and 7,000 tons of grain, which were all sitting there. That's enough to feed 20 to 30,000 people for a year. That kind of disaster, how do you model that? How do you understand it? 
And how incidentally do archaeobotanists, being clever people, uh, do totally different things with it by studying differences in the batches between different parts of the storage that seem to show from their weed species different fields. Literally, we're getting at late Bronze Age fields, individual villages sending their tribute in, right, and storing it at the center. I mean, we're really close to the granularity of life when we're looking at this kind of thing. Question six. Here's a young man having fun. Um, how were things made and circulated and consumed? Now, in a sense, one of the great, this is material science, in essence, one of the great successes of material science over 30, 40 years has been basically provenancing, where things come from and where they go to. But, and who am I to say this, Petilo? In a sense, what I think Tilo and colleagues have pioneered over the last 20 years is a much richer approach to this, understanding operational chains in manufacture, understanding transmission of knowledge, adoption of technologies, context of use, and actually getting a vastly richer understanding of all this wonderful stuff that we work with and dig up, how it was made, how it was used, what it meant. And there are three examples I'm going to use. One of them is Egyptian glass, where Tilo is the doyen of studies, really, in terms of this. So, I mean, in essence, Tilo just shout if I'm getting this wrong. We've known for a long time that Egypt, well, glass is a new technology of the late Bronze Age. It's nothing to do with windows, in case you're wondering. It's about substitutive technologies imitating things like lapis, amethyst, other materials. It's a plastic, what the Egyptians called glass, no, lapis from the oven rather than lapis from the mountain, which was Afghanistan. Okay? Um, we know they use it. We didn't know whether they just obtained it as raw ingots or whether they could actually manufacture those ingots. So the kind of work that Tilo was doing at Contia, in the Nile Delta, uh, in the Ramesses period, was understanding how we can work with the ingots we have, the residues we have, to understand and prove, as he did, that Egypt actually uh, doesn't invent glass technology, but it picks it up, localizes it, manages to use it, make it with local resources, and creates its own industry. How much do I get out of 10 for that? Good? Three, probably. Pass. <laughs> Pass. All right, good. Second one. My colleague, Marti, my colleague Marcos Martino Torres and Borja Lagara Herrero, studied early millennium gold working in its social context. So this is third millennium BC gold, just before the emergence of the palaces on Crete, and for a long time, people have tacitly assumed that this must be about some kind of elite behavior and the emergence of people who will therefore become palatial elites. Well, kind of wrong interestingly wrong, because what they were able to show is that there are complex patterns of really quite semi-skilled manufacture. Gold's not that hard to work. Fragmentation, cycling, odd beads popping up, bits being slipped off, bits being moved back on, jewelry being kind of, in a sense, sort of reconstituted from different bits that actually is suggestive of something quite different. Group bonding, ritual, collective action. And one starts to say, hang on, if that's what they're up to, what is the social basis of the Minoan palaces? Is it really elites, or is it very different forms of social collectivity? Interesting. And thirdly, uh, closer to the work that I've done with my colleague, Vangelio Kiriadzi, uh, the director of the Fitch Lab, another of the great centers of archaeological science in the Eastern Mediterranean, looking at the consumption of pottery among different Minoan farms on the island of Kithra, about 1500 BC. So each of those little pie charts is a farm, probably five, ten people. We know from Van Gelio's work on macroscopic and microscopic characterization that there are basically two sources of very different fabric. One up here and one down here. And those pie charts show how much of each, each farm is taking. And you might say, well, it's kind of boring. I don't think it's boring at all. I think it's extraordinarily interesting because there would probably have only been between two and five adults in each of those settlements. Each of those is making its own decisions about which pottery it wants. Yeah? We can also trace that in other things we haven't really mapped out here, like the decoration patterns on the pithoi, the rims on the pithoi, the kinds of decorated wares they want in general. Okay? And we can start to see, we're kind of, again, close to what individuals are choosing in prehistory. We don't know why. And frankly, I put the donkey up there, we don't know how this is circulated. And this is one of these things, you know, we think we know about the late Bronze Age, and then we think, no, we don't. Okay? 
How do people get hold of pots? Do they all walk up to the kiln and the potter and get them and bring them back? Does the potter come round with donkeys? How can you use this kind of distribution to understand microdispersal and human decisions among humble people? These are farmers, these are subsistence farmers on the small Greek island. Question seven. Briefly and naughtily, how might we learn more and more interesting stuff about imagery and text? Now, of course, one thing that I think Tilo would jump up and say if he weren't too polite is, of course, most images and most texts are themselves material things. They're clay tablets, they're pigments, they're plaster. So they themselves are part of the ever-expanding domain of material science. What I want to suggest is something slightly different. 3D scanning, machine learning. Surely there's something they're interesting they could do. Alex Aston has recently proposed one might do something very interesting with cycladic figurines to test the groupings, the fakes, the typologies we've come up with to see how actually we can improve our understanding and actually see at least test ourselves against the computer. And up here, I've just put forward up the naughty suggestion, why not unleash the robots on Beasley? You can't fail to learn something interesting, can you? Connoisseurship, micro patterning, machine learning, how might we actually try to understand what's going on? The same surely is true of text. Um, we have thousands and thousands of texts with vast backlogs to many areas of the Mediterranean. Not so much Cyprus or the Aegean, but certainly the Near East. How could we actually use new technologies to characterize them, to scan them faster, to get them out and published, and also to understand some of their regional variations, as well as the last decipherments? It's worth remembering, is Artemis in the audience today? She'd probably challenge me on this. We've still got three major un undeciphered scripts out there in the Mediterranean. Yep. Etruscan stuff, Linear A, Cypher Minoan. If you look back at the kind of ways and technologies that Michael Ventris used on Linear B, they're kind of proto-computational, aren't they? They're about grids, associations, probabilities. The power that a computer brings to do that would be very interesting to unleash. And I'm sure people have started trying. I'm not sure it's going to succeed, because the problem with all three of those scripts are that we have too little of them, no bilinguals, and frankly, they're probably dead languages in at least two cases with no more manual analog. So you may not know what you're reading when you get there. And that is tough. <laughs> those three conditions are basically defining the undefined, un unknown scripts around most of the world, undeciphered scripts around most of the world. But I do want to draw attention to one pioneering combination of classical typological and computational approaches by Michele Corazza and Silvia Ferrara and team, trying to determine the mathematical values of the fraction signs in linear A and running this through tens of thousands of computational sessions to see what regularities come up. And very neatly, their values then work with linear B's later borrowings of those symbols for non-fractional numerical equivalents, which is always one of those neat things you go, ooh, that's really working, isn't it? That's really working. Nearly there. How long have I got? Probably minus 10 minutes. That's fine. <laughs> what are we missing? Well, we're missing a lot of things. We're missing organics, of course, textiles, basketry, food. One of my favorite obscure details, if I remember it correctly, about Halasul Tarteke is there are remains of Nile perch there. They didn't swim. I really hope they weren't brought fresh. That's a trade in late Bronze Age preserved fish, big fish. Incidentally, this is the only picture of Nile perch I managed to find on the internet that didn't have a kind of wannabe Hemingway, white Hemingway, holding up a big fish. So at least it's a little bit there, but you get the scale. What is, after all, inside base ring jugglets? You're nodding knowingly, some of you. I think that one's still out for out, out, out for grabs, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> Let's see if in five years it's not. But there are also people in the gaps. I'm interested in how we actually understand socially the gaps in the population record. One thing that's become very popular, this is not a particularly good example, um, is something called sun probability distributions, where you run lots of radiocarbon dates together and you see where there are spikes and gaps, and then you try to say, oh, that's interesting, why is there a gap there? Could this be something to do with changing demography? Well, you can think of many reasons why that might not be the case, um, but there clearly are, I think we're becoming increasingly aware 
that there are real booms and busts in demographic levels throughout prehistory, and they're quite sharp sometimes, and we don't understand what they mean. And I think we move towards catastrophist explanations way too early. How quickly can the populations decelerate, become less visible, disperse in, in ways? So I think that's, that's a big, big gap for me. And having told several stories against myself in this lecture, I can't resist this one. Um, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I was struggling with the end of the early Bronze Age and the Cyclades, late third millennium BC. Big period across the eastern Mediterranean of abrupt change, end of the old kingdom in Egypt, collapse of the Akkadian Empire, disruptions in Greece. And I was trying to work out, well, what could have actually gone on in the Cyclades? One popular theory coming up then and still hanging around is that we can see a pretty bad climate downturn around that time. However, people respond differently to climate, as we've already said. I came up with various other things, and then, and I actually remember writing this sentence in the late summer of 1999. A fourth potential factor that has received less attention than it deserves is an expanding frontier of epidemic, propagated in the newly integrated zones of urban communities across the Near East and their outlying areas. I remember writing that sentence and thinking, I haven't got tenure yet. I probably shouldn't be writing this, it's madness. No one will believe it. <coughs> well, last summer, well, a year ago, they finally discovered an archaic, probably less lethal, non-flea-borne genome of Yersinia pestis, or plague, in Minoan Crete, somewhere between 2300 and 1900 BC, exactly that period. Now, I think it's important to say don't jump on the bandwagon and say, oh, they all died horribly of bubonic plague, because that disease was super different then, almost certainly. It's an extinct variant we've got today. But what is interesting, what I argued in 2000, the end, was I thought what was going on was that changing conditions of maritime connectivity, particularly sailing shipping, was changing the conditions and the practices of life in the Cyclades and disrupting the whole way of life and leading to a gap in our visibility. What I think is interesting, that's when plague comes in. So there's something going on between demography, connectivity, maritime technology, and epidemic. They're linked. How they're linked, who knows? But how exciting that we can even begin to say something like that without thinking, I probably won't get tenure for saying that. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay? And incidentally, the quote I put after that then was William McNeil's Plays and People, 1976, because that's all that was out there to talk about. What are we missing more generally? Writ large. Well, Mediterranean Africa. The Mediterranean has a southern shore, its own internal global south. This is a point politely ignored by 90% of historians, though notably not as classicists or medievalists. And we might recoil from the kind of appalling statements that Emil Ludwig made half a century ago to the effect that, however much we love it, the Acropolis is worth more than the entire history of Morocco. That's a paraphrase. You can have the Acropolis without not finding that a fairly awful thing to say. Uh, but we're kind of complicit in that attitude, because we don't go there to look. Julie Lucarini and I brought together, a few years ago, all the radiocarbon dates from what we call Mediterranean Africa, the strip running from roughly the, from Suez to the apex of the Nile Delta through to Atlantic Morocco. That was the pattern, less than 2,000. Sturt, I don't want to put you on the spot, I meant to ask you yesterday, how many radiocarbon dates for Cyprus or Crete? Roughly, ballpark, very crudely? I shouldn't ask. I'm sorry, that's really awful to ask. Make it up. Look, it's your ex-colleague in the database. You should check there. <laughs> embarrassing with you, actually, because... Okay. Um, fewer than it should be. I would say that's fewer than for South East England, I a guess. Okay? And it's also extraordinarily distributed. And I'm very proud to say that with the director of the Egyptian Grand Museum here, a third of the total is used to date Old Kingdom pyramids in Egypt, okay? That is how a fair cave, almost all the dates in Libya. You can see the nation state and impact here, can't you? I mean, you've got, this is Tunisia, that's Carthage, smattering of dates in Algeria, and then booming up in Morocco again. But we started to use this as a cipher for how little we knew about 
Mediterranean Africa. And I think, in fact, there's a twofold problem. There's the Nile Delta. And if I can bang on about the Nile Delta for 30 seconds, I will indulge that. Because the Nile Delta is about 50% of the arable land in Egypt. Fairly, roughly. It is largely under meters of mud, and therefore very difficult to archaeologically activate and access. It probably has the potential to turn upside down many fundamentals that we think we know about ancient Egypt. I hope I'm not insulting anyone here. The origins of Egyptian agriculture probably sit somewhere under the mud. We occasionally find them at places like Saïs, but hardly glimmering them. When we do dig at places like Avaris, later Contier, where the, the glass was found, we find an extraordinary society that was excoriated by the New Kingdom pharaohs as a Hyksos, invaders, and uh, bad people, basically. But actually, if you look at it, it's another Egypt. Super cosmopolitan, super powerful, reaching all over the Eastern Mediterranean and producing a completely different civilization. That's what's out there. That's what might actually turn us around into having a very different understanding, at least of the relationship between Egypt and the Mediterranean. We're missing most of the intermediary. And then there's the rest. And here it's simply not looking hard enough, particularly in the Maghreb. There have been hints for a long time. Bell beakers coming up all over northwest Morocco and eastern and western Algeria. These are signs of a maritime trade network that extends from Britain through to Iberia and into the western Mediterranean. The site of Valencina de la Concepcion, which is another must do for any lecture, this is Copper Age Spain, third millennium BC, contemporary with Filia and early Bronze Age in Cyprus. You look at the scale, that is a kilometer. Gulp, okay? And just in case you were thinking, well, yeah, but. That is just one of the material objects found for it. And yes, it's a dagger napped on rock crystal. <laughs> okay? And if that just allows you to recalibrate the importance of Iberia in the third millennium BC, I hope you've got there. But the reason I put it up now is that sites like this and many others have been producing ostrich egg and elephant ivory for a long time, including this recent find for Valencina of an intact ivory tusk imported and isotopically fingerprinted to North Africa. The challenge, of course, is to find these societies at home, what these Moroccan North African societies are actually like when they're not simply exporting bits of it. We know genetically people move between Spain and North Africa. We have the genetics of that. We have individuals who are African buried in Iberia and buried incidentally in Malta um, at about the same period. The challenge is to find those societies at home. That's what I'm trying to do, but that's definitely for another time. But I think the chance, and this is really interesting because it's a general, general rule for Africa, there's a chance for Mediterranean African archaeology to jump the immediate, intermediate stages, to go straight to the future, to go straight to what we're doing now, to do really good archaeology that brings it right up to the front line very fast indeed. Okay. What I hope has come over is the excitement of these times and the opportunity to ask some really ambitious questions of the early Mediterranean that without collaboration from and the integration of archaeological science, we can never begin to hope to answer currently or at a future date. I hope I've also shown incidentally that there is really no opposition between scientific approaches and understanding of human agency, symbolism and contextually subjective meanings. In short, the heartland of the social sciences and the humanities. But this event is a celebration of one particular center of excellence within archaeological science and of the achievements of one particular post. And the Cyprus Institute exemplifies to my mind best practice in collaborative research across the sciences and across archaeology without geographical or conceptual borders. It's always a super exciting place to come. And I have to say, I work in quite an exciting place too. So if I'm excited here, it's very exciting. In terms of individuals, we've seen, I hope, in this lecture how much archaeological science can reveal about people in the past, their lives, their deaths, their movements, their choices, what they made, and what they consumed. Now, Tilo, I trust that your own osteobiography, should it ever come to pass, lies many, many years in the future. 
But my somewhat fantastical hope is that by that distant time, science will have advanced sufficiently to pick up some trace and to bear witness to the future of the sheer length and the breadth of your good influence and contribution to understanding the human past across the Mediterranean and far beyond. So thank you. Cyprian, thank you very much indeed, and for sticking with the time, and <laughs> for your very kind words, but I would definitely say I only work with other people together. Alone in a cave, what can I do? So, and this is the place to be. So, thank you again. I think we have prepared a reception outside, which will be a nice opportunity for people to ask questions, to talk about these very stimulating thoughts that you have thrown up, which will be enough work for generations of at least a center with eight to 12 scientists working on it. <laughs> no, but um, let's do one step after the other. So thank you so much for this talk, Cyprian, for coming here. Thank you for the audience, for your time of coming here and sharing in this experience, and you are most welcome now to share in our reception outside. Thank you.